Good morning, Pastor Connor here at 7.30 on May 21st. So good to be with you and spend a few moments reflecting and praying together. Okay, here's what I want to do today. We're going to return to a subject that we actually addressed on Tuesday. Now, by now, you should be pretty familiar with the phrase critical race theory or critical race ideology. And by now, you no doubt have heard me warn against its dangers and its falsehoods. What I want, to, I want to return to it today to help you again see how ubiquitous or widespread it is, how dangerous it is, how simplistic it is, and how a robust appreciation for the doctrine of creation is the antidote for it. Let me show you. Okay, so I came across this article in the Wall Street Journal. I made a copy of it for you today. You can see classroom chaos in the name of racial equity is a bad lesson plan, all right? So, we're gonna look at that today. Uh, I think that was on May 11th is when it showed up in the Wall Street Journal. Anyway, uh, you read the, the title, and by now, when, when you see this, uh, this term equity, right, you see that word equity? All right, so you know that, that that word equity is a code word for critical race theory or critical race ideology. And just as a reminder very quickly here, critical race theory or ideology is an inherently segregationist ideology that divides people by their group association, black, white, trans, same-sex attracted, privileged, etc. All right? These groups are labeled as either oppressor or oppressed, victimizer or victimized. So the oppressor group is by default racist and guilty for society's ills. The oppressed group is, by default, innocent and justified in its moral outrage, even its immoral behavior. So if you need to riot in the name of uh, racial equity, your rioting is perfectly legitimate. You're, you're morally justified in, in, in basically immoral behavior. But at root, it's about and this is, this is what we need to understand. It's about guilt and innocence. And that's really critical to understand here. It's about guilt and innocence. It's, it's actually a secular religion. All right? Now, it misses God altogether. But it's a secular religion trying to deal with guilt and innocence. And those are huge concepts. Right? So it's, the problem is, though, that it gets its diagnosis wrong. And then it gets the prescription wrong. And, well... That just makes for some pretty bad medicine. So, let me show you. It diagnoses disparity of outcomes. Okay, so different outcomes. So it diagnoses disparity of outcomes as de facto evidence of racial or sexual discrimination. And to solve the problem, it prescribes equity. Results must be equitable or proportionate. All right, let's see how this plays out in the matter of school discipline, which is a, what this editorial is about. Okay, so Mr. Jason Riley, he writes this. In 2012, the Education Department released a study showing that black students were more likely than their white peers to be suspended and expelled from school. This disparity was taken as evidence of racial bias. And two years later, the department issued threatening guidance letters to school districts across the country. The letters essentially warned the, that schools would face federal civil rights investigations if black suspension rates didn't come down. Schools were pressured to discipline students not on the base uh, or discipline students or not to discipline them based on race rather than on behavior. And many administrators and teachers obliged. Okay, so look, a disparity was discovered. Okay, black students were more likely than white students to be suspended and expelled from school. So the discipline rate was not proportionate. Why? Well, one explanation put forth by critical race theory is systemic racism. All right, black students are being unfairly targeted by white racist adult teachers and administrators, right? That's one explanation. Now, if that's the case, if that's the diagnosis, 
What's the prescription? Instruct schools to reduce black suspension and expulsion rates. And they did. Any guesses what happened? Well, bullying and disruptive behaviors increased. Fighting and gang activity increased. Learning decreased. Test scores dropped. Safety became more of a pressing issue. And students who wanted to learn had additional roadblocks placed in front of them. And teachers were completely hamstrung because they couldn't discipline disruptive behaviors. And you know which group was disproportionately affected by that policy decision? Which group suffered the most because of that prescription? Black students. Jason Riley writes this. He says, black students go to school with other black students. And then he quotes Gail Harriet. She's a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, who says, if teachers fail to keep order in those classrooms out of fear that they will be accused of racism, it is these minority students who will suffer most. So guess what happens, all right? Inequity in educational results gets more pronounced as ethnic minorities have additional roadblocks put in front of them. But what if systemic racism is the wrong diagnosis? What if critical race theory is wrong? And this is where looking at actual data matters, all right? We're taking a more holistic approach to the question matters, where critical race theory crashes onto the rocks of reality's shore. Mr. Riley writes this. If, as opponents of school punishment insist, adult white racism rather than student behavior is driving the black-white disparity in suspensions, why are white students disciplined at double the rate of Asians? And what explains the fact that many of the teachers and principals and school administrators deciding which kids are suspended are themselves black and brown? See, that doesn't fit the narrative, does it? So critical race theory just ignores it, like it doesn't exist. For critical race theory, disparity equals discrimination. They see, that, that's, that's key to understand. Disparity equals discrimination. So inequity in results equals discrimination, equals racism. Mr. Riley writes again, the unwillingness of these critics even to consider non-racial explanations for group differences in school discipline rates is troubling. A 2019 report by the Institute for Family Studies found that black students living with both married parents had suspension rates not only, that were not only less than half as large as those for other blacks but also less than the suspension rates for white students from families that weren't intact. Statistical disparities can't automatically be equated with discrimination, and pretending otherwise can lead to bad policies that harm the very people you want to help." End quote. Now, if you were listening, listening carefully, you actually heard the answer. Okay, so we can all acknowledge the disparity. We can see the difference in suspension rates. But when we look at the situation holistically and consider explanations beyond the spectacularly simplistic racial explanation of critical race theory, we can see the answer. Okay, we can see the solution to the problem. We can see the right prescription for the diagnosed problem. It's the creational family. It's man and woman putting life in this order. Marriage, sex, babies, for life. It's men and women getting married, then having babies, and then raising those babies together as a part of their life mission and purpose. It's men and women doing the hard things of self-denial, self-control, and self-sacrifice for the sake of their children that they have born and that they are raising. But this is the thing. This is the thing being systemically attacked by government and by critical race theory and groups like, quite frankly, Black Lives Matter. Okay, just read their founding documents. It's as explicit as could be. 
we hear critical race propaganda about love makes a family and marriage equality, and now we get this ridiculous statement about birthing persons to replace the concept of moms. And this goes on and on. But they're all euphemisms to conceal the matter at hand. Unchecked adult desires. So you get down to it. That's what it is. And here's the thing. They believe that adults should have the right to act upon their desires without impediment. That's dangerous. It's destructive. Now look, Christianity doesn't deny adult desires. It doesn't deny that some of these desires are intense. What Christianity says, based upon the reality of the Creator's expressed will in creation, is that the ones who should do the hard things of self-denial, for instance, should be the adults for the sake of the children. The reason we have the situation we do in many of the schools across our country is because adults refuse to do the hard thing of self-denial, self-control, and self-sacrifice for the sake of their children. Instead, they're trying to pin the problem on racism. It's absolutely tragic. I mean, the very thing that will allow students to flourish is the very thing we refuse to endorse and support. And the children, quite frankly, the children, they're the ones paying the price. So look, Christianity offers a better way, a much better way. First, Christianity rightly diagnoses the problem. Sin lives in all of us, and it manifests itself in destructive desires. And the answer is repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. To be made new, to be reoriented away from our sinful desires, to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this allows Christianity to diagnose the problems in our schools. The creational family is being rejected and is disintegrating. And the children are suffering because of it. Now, is racism real? Yes. Some people are racist, and Christianity condemns that because, look, we're all one race. We're equally bearing the image of God. But racism is too simplistic of a diagnosis, and it's distracting from the very thing that will allow children to flourish which is the creational family. Adults who get married, then have kids, and raise them together, their needs before our wants. Now, we're going to have to stop there for now, but that's a great place to start a meaningful conversation on a helpful way forward. So, I welcome your questions, comments. I mean, these things are showing up in the news all the time. And once you're kind of tuned into it, you can see it all over the place. And if you just want to get down to a very simple answer, it's the creational family. Go back to creation. What is God called good? Let's embrace that. Let's teach that. Let's live that. And yes, adults, it will mean that we have to do hard things. Self-denial, self-control, right? Yes, but for the sake of the children, that's exactly what we are called to do. Okay, we'll stop there for now. Let's take a moment to pray. God of creation, in the beginning you created male and female. You created marriage between male and female. You blessed marriage with the potential to procreate, to receive and raise children, and you called it good, even very good. Forgive us for undervaluing your creation, for failing to see the great worth and benefit of the creational family. Teach us to honor you by honoring what you have called good by defending what you have called good, by supporting and promoting what you have called good. Lord, many in our culture are overly enamored with race and gender. Help us again appreciate that we are one race of equal value, equally bearing the divine image. Keep us from pitting one group against another, from naively and simplistically blaming one group for all of society's ills. Instead, help us to see the sin that lives in all of us, and the shared need we all have for forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Keep our eyes focused on Jesus, on sharing his gospel, on announcing his kingdom, on extolling his truth, that you may receive glory, more might be saved, and we might live and flourish as your people. For you live and reign with your Son and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Thanks so much for taking your time to be with me today. I'm looking forward to welcoming you this weekend as we gather for worship at 9 o'clock. It's Pentecost Sunday. That's exciting. Pastor Johnson will be here on Monday, and I'll see you again on Tuesday. God's blessings on your day.